Hello everyone and welcome to another um, qualitative research type. We discussed several types. Uh, we discussed um, qualitative in general and then grounded theory, case study, and historical research. And today is the final type of qualitative research, which is ethnography. This is another very interesting uh, research type uh, design, and we're going to explore more about the meaning of ethnography and um, how a little bit different it is uh, from the other types. I mean, straightforward case studies are cases that you're studying. It's case related uh, for a specific phenomenon and historical, it's state straightforward uh, for a historical event that you're trying to look in the past to make changes in the future. Um, ethnography and grounded theory are a little bit close to each other and we're going to discuss the difference between both in order to have a clear picture in your minds on what's the difference between ethnography and grounded theory. Um, just to make sure that you know the difference between each type and qualitative research. Now, the first thing that you see in the first slide here is the meaning of the word ethnography. And this, if you know this, you'll understand completely, um, or it gives you a clue of what it means. So, if no, here, from the word itself, you know that it has to do with ethnic culture. Okay, so if no is about culture, it's the study of culture. Graphy is the description. So, graphy here is the description of an if no. Um, so this gives you a clue of how unique ethnography is. It is really the study of cultures, of the deepest human um, um, essence, which is their ethnicity and culture. So let's go into more details on what is ethnography. Uh, so it's the holistic approach to research um, in order to understand people within their social and cultural context. So the context, the setting, the culture, the race, the ethnic group, all of these are key words and, and key terminologies for um, an ethnographic researcher, a, a researcher who claims to be an ethnographer. That's a person who really likes to study human beings within the context and the setting of their culture and ethnicity and race, and um, seeks to describe, not necessarily understand, but describe the cultural context of this ethnic group. The underlying theoretical basis of ethnography is that people's actions and thoughts are dependent on a vast range of factors, and what they say and do in one context is not necessarily what they actually do in another. So, you are studying a specific natural event that's happening in a culture and you want to study and, under, and, and describe mainly this specific group in this specific context. What is happening here? That's your ethnographic research, is to look at this group in this specific situation and describe what they think and how they interact and all of that within that natural uh, occurring incident or setting. Um, therefore, to fully understand people's behavior, uh, opinions, and decision-making process, a researcher must spend time with them in their various physical and social environments. So that's another key word for ethnography. If you are really seeking um, to describe and explore a culture of a specific group of people 
um, and a specific ethnic group in a specific situation, you really have to spend time in that natural setting with this group of people. Otherwise, you'll be uh, not a, not true to the nature of ethnography. If you want to really study them and describe them, then you really have to be part of this setting for um, a, a time frame. Uh, it could be a longitudinal study where you are staying there for one year or a couple of years, or at least a uh, few good months, uh, three months probably, um, is a good amount of time, uh, is the minimum amount of time that you can um, uh, physically spend time with this group. The primary method of an ethnographer, if you would imagine, is to observe. You are there. You want to describe what's happening, and then then you'll have to basically uh, observe this group of, of of human beings in this cultural setting, in this situation, uh, to understand and describe more about their opinions, decisions, behaviors, beliefs, conflicts, all of that. In order to do this, you really have to observe closely. That's the key word here. So observe closely. This involves the immersion of the researcher into the lives of those that they are studying. Uh, the ethnographer seeks not only to observe and inquire about situations people are faced with, but actually to participate within them. Okay, so you're not only um, an outsider observer, but you really want to immerse yourself in the field. Immersing yourself could be um, interacting with people that you're observing while you're observing and um, uh, asking questions meanwhile, looking closely, interact to see reactions and actions that emerge from this interaction. So you're really close to the field, you're really close to uh, the people uh, that you are studying versus grounded theory or uh, any other qualitative research. You really if you're observing, you're really an outsider observer. You're looking at things to kind of check uh, with other information and other data, but not to um, interact to understand more and hence interpret more and describe more. Um, in, in ethnography, you really want to be close to the field, and close means immersed. Okay. Um, to understand more about ethnography, it, you really want to understand that it provides a window into um, uh, this. You, you're you're kind of you're providing a view for your audience or for the readers on on a specific group of people. So you focus on what what these people are doing, practicing, and interacting in this natural setting through observations, through close observations, because you are the window for the reader to, for them, for the reader to see through you what's happening for this group. So if you think about yourself as this window, then you have to be clear and vivid for uh, the reader to understand more, and this is not going to happen unless you do close observation and close interpretation of people's actions um, uh, within that natural setting. Recording and analyzing field notes are core research activities of an ethno ethnographer. So if you are observing, you'll have to have field notes. Taking notes, mental notes, is not going to be helpful to go back to. So you really want to have your notes close to you. You're always taking notes while you're observing um, and, and in order to be able to analyze afterwards. Um, 
Your field notes can be part of your observations. That's like a tool for this data collection uh, method or, or source. Uh, or it could be close to interviews. You're interviewing um, these people. You still can have field notes and record uh, video or tape, record the interviews. And you still take notes because, yeah, I want you to think about this closely, you're interpreting. In ethnography, you're always interpreting to describe things from your perspective of what is happening and what you're viewing. So without these field notes of your observations and interviews, if you don't have this, you're, you're missing your interpretations. You're, you're um, very uh, live if I may say, it's, it's hot, it's right there, you're, you're observing, you're writing notes right there at the instinct of what you feel about them. You're interviewing and something happens, you're writing a note right there, right then, to give yourself a clue of what you felt or how you felt or how did this interviewee um, express facial expression or gestures or things while he's talking, talking about what he's what his beliefs are, you still are reading between the lines. And without your field notes, you're not going to be able to capture this between the lines uh, from just listening to interviews or recording the observations. So you really want to have this interpretation live and ongoing all the time while you're in the field. Um, so this brings me to this Ethnography is an interpretive activity. Um, it's a, it, ethnography is representation of lived experiences, not reality. So I am not seeking reality. If I seek reality, I can write a documentary. I can write a historical research. But I'm really seeking interpretation of experiences, of what I really felt what I've really seen, what do these people really feel or uh, think reality is from their own perspective. So it's not an obsolete reality. It is not, um, you're not seeking facts. You're seeking experiences. Okay, so that's the uniqueness of ethnography right there. Um, some of the topics that you would consider ethnography for, if you're doing a cross-cultural analysis between the West and the East, and that was something that I, uh, that's my passion is for in many of my research writing. I, I wrote a research on uh, using classroom management uh, theories that are Western based and how is this implemented, how these classroom management theories implemented in the Middle East in Emirates. And I looked at this cultural perspective of teachers and how they perceive a lot of the um, acceptable norms and and beliefs from the West and how it is implemented in the classroom and how it's not realistic. So for example, uh, one of the theories talks about how students need to uh, keep a distance and um, uh, spaces, uh, personal space between one another and how teachers implement this in the classroom in the West by saying hands and feet to yourself. For example, that's a minor example, but just um, to give you a, a perspective of a cross-cultural. So one of the teachers was talking about the Middle Eastern culture and how this idea of keeping your hands and your feet to yourself is not realistic in the Middle Eastern cultures. Middle Eastern cultures like to hug and touch and feel and um, this is something considered the norm 
be acceptable. So to have students understand who are coming from Middle Eastern background, understand that they shouldn't show affection or or love or playful attitude with their hands is something very difficult. They, they see it as robotic and they don't see it as, as intimate. Even when students want to express um, frustration, they always like to to use their hands and, and body gestures. And this is uh, to some of the teachers said, um, they talked about how real, unrealistic that is. So an ethnographer can go and dig deeper into going to the, to the classrooms and looking at the kids and what their reactions are um, with regard to keeping their hands and feet to themselves and how do they feel when the teacher tells them this and they dig deeper into interpreting um, attitudes and, and attitudes and gestures uh, of the students and teachers when this specific rule is implemented, if that makes sense. Another topic would be giving a voice to the voiceless. So you are describing, uh, for example, females in a specific situation. So you really are going to immerse yourself in, um, for example, women who are under uh, paid uh, single mothers who are underpaid. Uh, this is a job of, a, of an ethnographer is to give a voice to these single mothers who are underpaid. And what are you going to do? You're going to immerse yourself into the lives of few mothers. You can use case study, ethno ethnographic case study, which you are looking at three maybe or four cases of single mothers but then you're using ethnography to immerse yourself into their lives and describe more about uh, their day-to-day -day and how they're dealing with things and what kind of payment are they getting and how inefficient or not realistic this pay is through the day-to-day -day life experience uh, you're interacting, you're observing, you're seeing how they're dealing with their kids, the day-to-day -day frustrations, all of that in an ethnographic case study. Um, another topic is uh, studying marginalized groups. That's a group within a larger group and how this marginalized group is affected in a specific um, problem. So you're picking a specific problem that this mar uh, uh, marginalized group is suffering from a uh, specific inequity in schools or classrooms and you're immersing yourself into their day-to-day -day frustration dealing with this inequity and how do they feel and uh, describe their interaction among themselves or among the um, popular, uh, their interaction with the popular group or the larger group. Uh, so that's an, another ethnographic research. Um, a comparative analysis like the one that I uh, talked about is also um, uh, between uh, two cultures or a culture within the culture. So it could be um, related to SES, um, lower SES and higher SES and the inner um, action between both and the day-to-day -day, uh, problems that each group is dealing with uh, in, comparing, in comparison to the other. Um, so yeah, so you're really, if, if your topic is related to perspectives of a cultural group, beliefs of a cultural group, or ethnicity, or race, then you are eligible to use ethnography. Um, you can certainly choose not to use ethnography. I mean, I many of my cultural studies, I did not choose 
um, ethnography every time. I just chose either grounded theory, sometimes I chose case studies, um, uh, sometimes I used um, simple qualitative uh, comparative analysis. But if so, culture is not only for ethnography. If I, this is what I what I'm trying to say. But if you want to dig deep uh, into culture, then ethnography is your case. If if your study has nothing to do with culture, ethnicity, or race, or perspectives or beliefs of a subgroup, then you're not eligible for ethnography. If that makes sense. Um, I hope it is. Uh, so these are a uh, layout of, but this is not the only topics that you can talk about in ethnography. I mean, these are just examples of topics that you can use for um, ethnographic research. Now, what are the core elements and characteristics of ethnography? We've talked about it before, but um, I would love to repeat it again. So. A characteristic of an ethno ethnographic research is definitely based on culture. You definitely want to be immersed in the field, so it has to be a field work. You cannot say, oh, I'm doing an ethnographic research, and then you do an, um, a search of documents and records of a specific culture group because now you're studying culture group no you really have to be immersed in the field um, you have to have observations and your observations are not like uh, any other observation your observations are immersed uh, in order to be able to interpret data so you are not only observing but you are immersed in the observation you can interrupt you can be involved you can interact um, key informant is one of the elements or characteristics that are optional so if you are if you belong to the culture that or the subgroup or the ethnicity that you are um, interpreting or studying then you don't you probably don't need a key informant you want um, a, a checker a person who can double check with you for validity but if you are a person that does not belong to a subgroup a culture ethnicity um, due to uh, you you probably need a key informant due to um, maybe language barrier if they don't speak the same language or subcultural barrier you don't have this cultural background if you are uh, uh, typical european white american and you are studying maybe um italian Americans who, are, who belong to the low SES, for example, so you lack a lot uh, about um, a, lot, a lack a lot of knowledge about uh, this this cultural subgroup. So you want a key informant, or if you are white and you are studying African American, then again you might need a key informant to just make sure that you're understanding. If you are uh, someone who wants to study Middle Eastern group or a Latin group, then you want the language, you want the culture. So you need a key informant to be with you uh, to to check with you and this key informant can be part of one of the participants who volunteers to be your key informant because of uh, an established uh, trust or background knowledge you both knew each other somehow uh, that can be your key informant now another key component or characteristic is interviews you are observing and you're immersed in the observation and you're involved and you might find yourself doing informal interviews while you're observing 
and you take your field notes of course um, and then you want to have some formal uh, semi-structured interviews with these people because you saw some stuff in the observational field and you want to confirm with them so you want a formal observation so interviews can really be layered between formal informal simultaneous within the field um, formal is when you have a setting to interview could be semi-structured or structured but usually in qualitative it's semi-structured is one of the best uh, format of it and informal would be more of a simultaneous interview when you ask specific questions while you're in the field uh, and doing observations or maybe having a cup of tea bumped into someone uh, from your participants and then you decided to just chat a little bit while you're standing or you saw them in the store and you talked a little bit that's again an informal simultaneous interview uh, okay so how is ethnography different than grounded theory Grounded theory is a methodology that involves developing theory through the analysis of data and we talked about this how from the word grounded theory, really grounding new information and making new uh, assumptions and theories based on the data collected. But in ethnography is the detailed and systematic study of people and cultures. You're really studying cultures in a systematic way and you're not looking to theorize anything. You're just describing and interpreting specific people with then their specific culture and subcultures. It aims in grounded theory. It aims to develop theories in relation to collected data, um, and in ethnography, it aims to understand a particular culture or community and describe them more. You're shedding light on, if you may say so. When you think of ethnography, you're shedding the light on this cultural group. In grounded theory, researchers don't consult literature before analyze, uh, analyzing data since it may influence their findings. Because you're emerging to find new theories, you really don't want to influence yourself too much into literature. Uh, but in ethnography, you really have to understand more about the cultural background that you're studying before you enter the field so that you'll have a specific perspective on um, the beliefs and uh, the interactions within this group. Um, sampling in ethnography, it's purpose, purpose of sampling. You are looking for um, this cultural group in, for example, you're looking for uh, African-American teachers. You are going to look at this sample with a specific purpose in mind, uh, but in the, um, in the grounded theory, you really have a big pool of people and you're doing maybe the questionnaire to uh, find whoever best fits within your theory or of study. So you really don't have you're probably thinking about math teachers and then you'll do some sort of a pool to to minimize the number of all math teachers uh, all middle school math teachers you'll either have a questionnaire to narrow it down based on specific criteria that you're hypothesizing and theorizing towards so that your sampling are more related to a specific theory in your mind or hypothesis. Whereas in ethnography, hypotheses are not really your, your concern. Uh, you're not going with a preconception to the, to the field, but you're looking for a purpose of sampling for specific people who belong and fit into this culture that will best give you a better description.
So when we go to data collection, as we discussed, we're going to now talk about data collection, data analysis, and validity. Um, so that first section, the first six slides, talk, we were talking about ethnography, the features, characteristics, the meaning, all of that. Now we're going to look at the methodology, the data collection, data analysis, and uh, validity or trustworthiness. You'll find it very close to or almost the same as a typical qualitative research. It's just that you are looking for specific features in ethnography like you are in a historical uh, research. Uh, typically in a data collection you want to have observations and you want to have interviews with the field notes and informant if needed. Okay, that's what we talked about. Now, triangulation, if you choose to do triangulation, which is, again, if you understood what I talked about in ethnography research, in ethnographic research, you are already interpreting. And your reader knows that you are interpreting. So, the data triangulation is really not as important because you don't care. You know that you are interpreting what's happening and describing what's happening based on your perspective. So right there, right then, you might be biased in the way you see it. However, you try to do your best um, from a co-checker of your data and all of that to make sure that your data is credible. But data um, collection, triangulation is not an issue. However, if you choose to have a third data method, data collection method or source, you can have either a focus group or uh, documents and records reviewing uh, to, to learn more about a specific cultural group. Uh, but again, it's optional. So, Based on what I just said, it's very important to remember these two notes, that you know that your data is not generalized. It, your description and your interpretation of this specific group is has to do with that specific group, not anybody else, not everyone else within this culture. Cannot say that all Egyptians think this way, no. The teachers who I interviewed think this way because you interacted with these specific people. Their attitude, behaviors, and beliefs relate only to them, not to every person who belongs to this culture. An explanation of data cannot be obsolete as cultures always change. So when you explain the data in your results, you cannot say that it's also an obsolete. It's something, this is how it is and it will never change. No, cultures change and develop, so things always change. So your, your research can be easily outdated. So you want to make sure when you do an ethnographic research, you are actually collecting the data, analyzing it, and writing it, and publishing it right away. Otherwise, when you try to publish it a few years later, your data might be considered outdated. And that's specifically for ethnography because you're really intimate and close to specific timing, specific setting, specific people, um, and specific culture that Things might happen to all of that that changes the set of the findings that you found. Okay, so that's data collection. Data analysis, you are doing the same. You're coding, and by coding, I know that you understand it now, but I just wanted to make sure that you know that coding, you are sifting through your notes and looking for threads that can be woven together. And you're writing notes on the margins while you're reading your notes. You read and reread your notes and write things on the margins, giving color codes for these notes in the margin. Every time you find this repeated idea, you write it in the margin and you color it red 
highlight it red or whatever. And from these codes and these notes in the margins, you start to make sense of things that can go into a larger picture, which is categories. Once you have big categories stemmed from these codes, you can um, put the codes under each category or codes from stems from the, the data itself, you can put them under these categories and then you reread your codes that you categorized to find common themes. Okay, interpretive themes um, has to be descriptive. So you did the coding, no margins, you created categories based on these codes, and then you put these codes um, in flashcards or post-it notes or whatever, collect all of these codes and put them under the categories that you picked for them, and then the themes emerge. Now, when you discuss your themes in the findings, you really have to be descriptive because they are interpretive themes. Okay, now how can you make sure that you are really interpreting, like really descriptive in your interpretation? You can ask yourself this list of questions while you're interpreting, just to make sure that you are describing everything uh, that can be. Questions like, what are people doing? What are they accomplishing? How exactly did they feel? How... Uh, what are the strategies that they're using to solve specific issues? Um, what kind of assumptions, uh, gestures they're making when they're feeling a specific feeling? All of these questions are uh, good questions that you should ask yourself when you're taking notes, field notes, and then when you're interpreting and analyzing the data to make sure that you're really descriptive. The more descriptive you are, the more uh, a good ethnographer you are. Ethnographers can be as deep as uh, looking at facial expressions, looking at inferences, things that were not said, but really um, probably the, the participant meant or was trying to refer to. And then validity or trustworthiness. In order to touch on credibility, you want to think about would the group being observed say that the findings were credible? Do they think that they're logical and reasonable? So when you're writing, you want to make sure that you're credible to your participants as well and that they'll be agreeable with what you're saying. Um, transferability, uh, would a reader be willing to transfer their results to another group or setting, maybe replicate? If you are descriptive and interpretive enough, then people can actually replicate from your research. Dependability, the researcher accurately describes the context, setting, and changes that may have occurred during um, the study. So what are the things that ensured you or can ensure the reader that you accurately describe the context? Through your observational field notes is something that really guarantees something like this. Um, conformability, if there were additional observers like your informant or your uh, checker, a uh, co-checker or something, that can do a conformability um, describe would would that person describe the situation close enough to your interpretation that will ensure conformability. Um, so that's that about ethnography. Um, I try to do both describe to you what is ethnography and the key elements and characteristics, topics that relate to it. And then I wanted to do this um, comparison between grounded theory and ethnography because I was 
I was foreseeing some confusion between ethnography and grounded theory because they really you can you can stem a grounded theory from ethnography. You can theorize things after you do your ethnographic research, but you're really not you're you're starting off not really looking to theorize anything, not like a grounded theory researcher. Um, so it kind of there's this thin line between both of them, but if you understand carefully that ethnography is all about the people and about the interpretation and description of things already happening and you're just shedding light on them, you'll understand the, the core difference between uh, ethnography and grounded theory. Um, you can do a case study ethnographic research too, like the example that I told you about. If you're shedding light on a specific group of people, but it's really not a group or a society or a community, it's much more like stories. People share the same uh, umbrella of cultural or ethnic background, but they have their own independent stories that you want to explore and dig deep and be intimate with. Uh, to interpret. And then the last thing is I gave you the methodological uh, key components and, and, and um, divisions, subdivisions of that. So you'll find the steps of proposal basically the same as grounded theory. You're going to talk about introduction, uh, the procedure and for ethno ethnography you really have to be detailed in the procedure because as you can imagine how sensitive it is if you're dealing with people interacting with people getting into the field all of that is very important for any kind of reader to read and, and learn about um, in order to be able to replicate and do other studies about different uh, cultures. So the more detail, it details in your procedure, the more uh, it's valid. Um, consent forms is a very essential piece of ethnography, so you will want to talk about it in your procedure. That because you are dealing with human beings and you're directly interacting with them through your observations. So unless they consent to any kind of notes that you're going to take about them, uh, any kind of taping or videotaping or whatever that is, um, unless the, the community, if you're going to a school, you have to have the consent of the school because you're interacting with people in the school. All of that is important because of the sensitivity of and the deep uh, interaction of the researcher with within the field. And then you're going to talk about your data collection, might or might not be triangulated. Ethnography doesn't really care that much because in its essence, it's already based on bias because you are interpreting based on your uh, what you see and what you feel about these people. Uh, data analysis is almost the same, coding, categorizing, and then thematic analysis. The emic and edic is not necessary to be vivid in your ethnography. You're really um, looking interchangeably between um, your interpretation and what the people are are saying but you're heavily interpreting what they're saying so um even can either perspectives might be vivid it depends on your topic if you're really looking at uh, doing this kind of comparative between what they say and then what you believe is the truth, then you can state it within your data analysis. Uh, but based on the overall design, it's based on interpretation of the researcher, then you shouldn't mention it in your trustworthiness 
uh, text, but you can mention it when you're analyzing if you are doing this comparative between what he or what a participant said or believes and what you really think or believe um, your interpretation is or infer from what they really want to say. So you emic and edict can be in the analysis of the result but not necessarily in the trustworthiness or validity because it's not a tool that you can use in your trustworthiness uh, and validity. The, the, the credibility, transformability and all of that is right here. You can see it right here and it's very straightforward and it's related to the group of people that you're observing. You stem your trustworthiness from the field, from the, your participants, basically. Alright, so I'm going to add this PowerPoint to week 11, I believe. Uh, it is, yes, and um, or week 12, sorry, it's week 12, so I'm going to add this uh, PowerPoint, I'm going to add the steps of proposal, which, I mean, I did not make any changes, but I'm just going to add it there as well. Uh, now, what you're working on is to tweak, and you, you're, you're not going to do a lot of writing this week, that's why, it's, I mean, it's okay, um, uh, to have uh, your submission close um, because you're not going to do a lot of different writing but you really want to tweak your question towards making it more cultural if you are choosing to uh, do ethnograph ethnographic research or if you choose to do a historical research then you want to tweak your question to be more towards understanding something that's happening in the past so for example uh, one of the questions of you uh, let me think of one of this class questions um, one of the questions is about uh, the use of, I think, Dreambox in math and the influence and effect of Dreambox. You can tweak the question here to, if you choose to do historical research, you can talk about the influence of new strategies in teaching math throughout the history of teaching math uh, and how this was this this view of change and view of um, new up-to-date uh, format of teaching math how did this influence student success throughout the years and in history so you can look at the past, student reactions in the past, teacher's reaction in the past, in order to, uh, in your mind, to um, develop new understanding and new tips for teachers who are dealing with new changes in the classrooms in the future or now in the present. And gives them, you want to give them more tips into how to deal with new changes or how students usually deal with new changes and how usually new changes affect their learning. Um, historical research is really about studying things in the past in order to make sense of it in the present or in the future and learn lessons from it. Uh, if you are a person who will look at a um, question about uh, minorities and inequalities, then you can look at the history of minor minorities and inequalities and how it was usually an issue within the classroom in many fields and how in the past they, why would this happen usually and then how teachers interacted with that in order to get tips and reasons uh, for the present and the future. Um, but if you're looking at culture, if you can tweak your question towards more of culture, 
disadvantagement, minorities, cross-cultural relations, all of that, then you can use the ethnography, of course. So make your choice, your data collection, data analysis, and trustworthiness might be overall the same. You're just going to need to tweak and change a few things here and there. Um, but I really want to see the difference in your question. So please write your tweaking in the question to see that you understand what is a historical research and what is an ethnographic research. So I want to see some keywords that <coughs> that relate to either one of that. Um, and so yeah, so choose one and write about it and it's due Monday midnight and then I want you to really enjoy your Thanksgiving break until we start uh, next Tuesday. Uh, if you have any questions please watch the video as soon as you can. I hope that you did watch the historical video already and now you have the ethnographic um, video so watch them, understand them, read the text and how, if you have any questions for clarification about the designs, uh, please email me ASCP before you start writing and don't wait um, to write your paper until the last minute because questions emerge from when you start writing and if you have a question Sunday night, I'm not going to be able to answer it until Monday morning and then you're working on Monday so you have limited time to get this answer implemented or integrated into your paper. So just give yourself a little bit of um, head start, uh, if you may say. Keep the communication on. If you have any questions or uh, any concerns, please email me, call me, or schedule an appointment, and I'll be happy to help. All right. Good luck, everyone.